Hello everybody again. Welcome to part two of the question and answer videos. I'm answering questions that you guys answered from the last Q&A video, which was last Monday. Anything you guys want to ask me, go down below, ask me anything you want. I'll answer them in the next Q&A next Monday, okay? So this is part two. If you haven't seen part one, go watch part one first. Um, and let's get started right away with Cutie Pie. And I can't remember where you're from, cutie pie. Oh, and that's another thing. If you guys can tell me and all of us your locations, just give us a brief idea where you're from. I just think it's really interesting to know, okay? Kind of brings us all together. So, cutie pie asks me, and thank you for asking, can you tell us if it was safe in Puerto Vallarta? Can you tell us which resort that was and the weather? Yeah, I'll try and tell you as much as I can right away. Um, so, let's see, Puerto Vallarta is way far down the west coast on the Pacific side of Mexico, and um, it was hot, 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 hot. I live in Las Vegas. It's way, temperature-wise, way hotter here, and I can't remember the, you guys, I know most of you guys use Celsius, and we use Fahrenheit. Um, it's here in Las Vegas, summertime, this time of year, 110, 105 uh, 115 degrees Fahrenheit. That's super, super hot. Okay, but now down there, it's uh, it was in the low 90s, 90 stuff like that. But massive humidity. It rains every single day. It's a jungle there. This is a dry desert. Zero humidity. Zero. So you can. I mean, the difference is insane. 190 down there. Would feel feels like 120 here, like it's just insane. Um, it takes a long time to get used to. You pretty much don't. Pretty much, it's so hot. And I and I I lived a lot of my life in like down south, Houston, Texas, and that's that's hot and humid. But man, this is so much worse. It's so much more. Um, pretty much, and I like the heat, but pretty much, uh, you're sweating. You're sweating. It takes a while to stop sweating. But if you're walking around, if you're eating, any, doing anything, you're sweating. <laughs> um, but I love the heat, so I would actually take that over cold. But um, yeah. Um, I stayed at what's called the Emperor. Um, there's Old Town, which is the old part of Puerto Vallarta. And you can identify that by this big pier that comes out. And it looks like a big sailboat. In the last Q&A videos I did, I had it behind me. You can see it, the sailboat pier. And uh, it's old Puerto Vallarta. So it's, you know, uh, smaller streets, smaller buildings, all open restaurants and bars, all on the beach. Um, Kim lives in downtown Puerto Vallarta. Uh, and there's just, it's expanding. It's growing huge. There's some amazing parts. Um, I saw some people's rooms or condos that are just amazing. I mean, I've seen some really, really top-notch suites around the world. And I, I saw a suite there that just is the most amazing suite I've ever seen. But um, uh, what else? Is it safe? Well, you're in Mexico. Um, it's a safer tourist spot than the other tourist cities. There's some now you can't visit anymore as a tourist. Uh, Puerto Vallarta was very safe for me. Um, I didn't notice really almost never, almost never saw police there. Um, there's no real presence of the federales, the federal, uh, police. Um, uh, I didn't see anything bad happen. Nothing bad happened to me. Nothing bad happened to anybody I know, except the typical in Mexico, what you're going to deal with guys is just getting kind of charged too much, scammed, ripped off. So just be aware. Best thing I can advise to you is be aware of money, okay? So do the math. Know the exchange rate so you know it really well because uh, what I notice is people just paying absurd amounts of money for things. Um, there's a subscriber that paid, she had one drink on the beach and she paid 500 pesos. She paid like over $30 just for a little drink. I mean, we're in Mexico, guys. That, that would cost a couple bucks, a few bucks, you know? So be careful. Um, another thing, Kim Wilson was running like crazy, picking people up 
one at a time at the airport to give them rides. And two days later, I, I've discovered that Uber is there. <laughs> Uber in Mexico. Dirt cheap for rides. Okay, so like I paid someone $20 US money to just drive me around a couple blocks. I found, that I found Uber and I mean, you know, a ride to my hotel room from a taxi could be 30, 40 bucks. But Uber, it was 100 pesos, six bucks, you know. So do the exchange rate, know what it is, learn some of the words, my God, you know. Uh, um, what else? Oh, real simple. You have money. This is a huge, I'm serious. When you pay somebody something, be, okay, there's a lot of bartering and stuff and there's also a lot of room for miscommunication, different languages, and, and this is a scam. This is a huge scam that they do in Mexico all day. I wish I had some money with me, but I don't. Um, it, it's just, it's real simple, guys. It's find out what the price of something is Make sure you agree to it, that you know what it is in your country's money, so you know what you're paying, and then tell them. If this is a, uh, let's say if this is a $500 bill, 500 peso bill of theirs, okay? And they tell you something costs 500 pesos. You hold a 500 peso bill up and you go, 500 pesos. You say that's, that's what it is and you hand it to them. And you don't turn around and you make sure that's the deal and it's done because what they'll do is you'll, you'll hand them money and they'll distract you and then they'll slip something out of it. Oh, look what you gave me. They'll, they'll change it with something else. You give me a, a $100 bill. Or, or the, they'll have somebody, you know, and get your attention like that and you'll come back and, oh, sir, look what you gave me. And you're like, oh, God, I finally give you a 500. Here you go. You know, just stuff like that, man. Um, I, you, you're not, don't, you don't need to worry too much about getting robbed, mugged, shot, killed, beheaded, things like that, okay? Um, but bet, another best advice I can give you guys is just be careful where you go. Um, don't be stupid. When you're walking around looking for something, it only takes one wrong turn to go down a bad street and you're now the only person on the street. That's just not safe. I, I stick around tour spots. Therefore, be careful where you get your, your room and stuff, you know? Get a nice place uh, on the beach. On, on Know that it's on a, a busy tourist street. But you don't have much to worry about, Guadalajara, okay? Um, I've been all over Mexico. And I've been in cities that you couldn't walk in today or you'd be in a lot of trouble. But, uh, so it's just, it's obvious stuff, guys. When you leave the country, it's not like home. So I hope that helps. Um, anything else you wanna know about it, let me know. Thanks. Okay, Claire from the United Kingdom. Hello, Claire. I've been fine for eight months now until the last few days where I felt drained and panicked for no reason. And now I've just had a nightmare again, always demon themed when I get them like I'm being dragged off my bed and I have to fight it off me. If I'm, if I'm doing well and I'm happy for the most part, why is this still happening and will I ever be okay again? Um, well, Claire, th this, I'm going to guess, you know, that this is what I've talked about quite a bit. And there's this whole process, recovery process, healing process, whatever you want to call it. It's so much more than just feeling better, guys. You're going to feel better. Better. You're going to feel better. You might even start one day... Um, feeling like you used to or feeling normal without doing any kind of real therapy, soul searching, digging, learning, you know, if you just kind of keep doing the same thing you always do, you, there, it's, it, you have the possibility of eventually feeling better. Drugs make you feel better. You know, you start taking drugs, you feel better. But there's so much more and I'm guessing that you haven't really done that kind of stuff, Claire. Um, I'm guessing not much therapy, not much working with a professional, and not really learning maybe why this all happened. Um, typical, I always talk about, is your parents taught you not to meet your needs, to concentrate on other people's, and 
maybe you need to work on a lot of stuff. But what tells me, what, what's plainly obvious is that you have some things that are bothering you, right? Because that's why you're thinking about them. That's why your brain, what your, what your brain's doing is saying, look, some stuff we need to work on, Claire. There's some stuff I need to heal from. There's some stuff I'm not sure about what happened. And there's some stuff that hurt me still. I'm still hurting from. Okay, so it's not just feel better. And by doing the things that you have to do, you, you will feel good, happy. That's the goal. So not just feel better, it's work. There's work. Um, hire a professional, Claire, and let them know about all this stuff and start talking about these things. Um, your dreams, we, we make up weird dreams that may seem like, you know, what the hell is that? But, you know, they say write down your dreams right when you wake up. You have 30 seconds about that we think about it and then we forget. So if you keep pad and paper by your, pad and paper and a pen by your, by your bed, write down immediately what your dream was about. More importantly, how you felt. What was going on in here with your body? What, 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 you know, what was the gist of the, of the nightmare? I'm, you're having dreams about demons. Yeah, I, I get that, you know. It's not really the devil that your brain's worried about, right? Your brain's worried about your ex or whoever hurt you. That I mean, if, if you still think he's a demon, there's some still healing that needs to be done, right? Okay, I hope that makes sense. And it sounds obvious, but that's what we need to do. Ella. <clears throat> Hello. My question is, do narcissists ever abandon primary supply? Of course. I went right back into his evil web. He texted me for me to go to his job. He said I was the one to leave. Oh, he said that you left him. His, he reverses truth. Now he returned. He says he is going back to his ex and blocked me. Then he says he wants to be friends. We were engaged. He left two times. I went no contact, build my self-worth, and he returns to triangulate. Yes, this is a pattern. This is a pattern. And try, and try and see the pattern and discover it and identify it and uh, stop it. Stop it. You're in control of you. He's in control of him. He's not in control of you. You're not in control of him. You can't make him do anything you want. He can't make you do anything he wants. Stop focusing on him. Focus on yourself, okay? If, if you're going back to him, then it's really not over in here. You understand? I know we always point to our heart and stuff, but really it's our it's here and we it needs to be over in here, Ella. So we need to start doing more to tell ourselves it's over. Okay, and not make it so easy for him to contact you again, okay? I'm telling you guys, no contact. We just can't contact. We can't if 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 a manipulator has done all the damage that you have in your head and it's this hard to stay away from them, it's this hard to get over them, it's this hard to stop thinking about them, can't have contact with them. I'm sorry, Ella. Don't feel bad. We start over. We make mistakes. Life is mistakes. We just don't keep making them again, okay? Good luck. Sarah. Uh, I can't remember where anyone's from and nobody's telling me. Can you guys tell us your locations? That's all I ask. Uh, be general if you don't want to be specific, please. Thank you. Um, hi, David. Hello, Sarah. When narcissists discard or leave you, why are, they, why are their final words something to hurt you? Mine left me calling me horrible names and telling me to move on and they never want to be with me again. He said that because I started to hang out with my friends when his, he first started the discard. It was my fault and I made him realize who I truly was. Then, silent treatment. All attempts of me contacting him have gone ignored. I've started me, my, no contact now, but his last words were very hurtful. Is that a form of punishment? My last words to someone could never be something mean or hurtful. I'm sorry, Sarah. I'm sorry. Um, so... If, if you didn't, if you guys didn't have boyfriends and girlfriends yet in grade school, and I mean like 10, 11, 12 years old, do you remember 
Don't you remember though that some people did, were already starting to date? And do you remember how it, it was all fine, but when they broke up, it just always had to be bad? That, that's what I remember. I remember when they broke up, it was like, ooh, and you know they'll never go near each other and, and they'll say bad things about each other maybe or whatever. Um, they just can't handle it. They, these are emotional children and they have pers their, their personality is disordered. They have never finished developing emotionally. Their parents haven't taught them anything. Their parents have massive problems themselves. They are experiencing pain and hurt. They can't think about anything else but themselves. So they can't understand that you're hurting too. No, I'm hurting. I'm hurting. I'm hurting. You're in control. It's your fault. Um, silent treatment is because they don't know how to talk. Simple. And they won't end it. They know how to do that, you know. Keep it open, right? Um, they got to hurt you at the end because their ego's bruised, okay? False egos is, is I don't know who I am, so I'm just going to say I'm better. I'm better than people. I'm better than others, you know? People like us that may have dealt with, you know, depression and low self-esteem and things like this, then we, we just hope to be equal <laughs> someday. But if you build that false ego to cover it up, you're going to say you're better than everybody else. That's the narcissism, right? Um, the egocentric, the egocentric omnipotence, right? Um, so it's just, oh, you don't want to be with me? I can't handle that. My ego says I'm better than that. That doesn't, that doesn't coincide. It, 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 it's wrong. My ego's here and you're saying you don't want to be with me? Huh? Or uh, the fear of abandonment, I'm going to lose you. I can't ever end the relationship. Um, you're, say, you, you, you're saying it's over or just I tell you it's over and you accept that. That's not the end of your world. It should be to lose me. You know, I hope that, I hope that makes some sense. Um, don't know where you're from. Please tell us your locations. Uh, Branio fan. I had a woman cut off culmination after I was good to her, then replaced me quickly. Could not keep herself out of jail. But the thing I don't get is why she discarded a good man. Um, good question, right? Because, you know, I know we are, were so good to them, right? We gave them all our time. We gave, gave them all our energy and we were so patient and we forgave them every time they hurt us and they broke us, broke the bank and made us lose the house and, you know, said all these bad things and then, you know, and then they discard us. And then they go be with somebody who is just a loser or bad person or doesn't treat them good like we did. Why? Why? Right? Well, the good person feels good after a while. And, I, and I'll say it's not enough, but nobody is enough. Nobody or anything is enough for a borderline, a narcissist, a psychopath, or a sociopath, or histrionic. It's never enough. You or nobody else on this planet is ever enough for them, okay? So a good person meets a lot of needs, makes me feel safe and secure, and I can rely on you and, uh, you know. But if, but, but, you, this, you gotta understand that we make ourselves happy, guys, and they, they're trying to make themselves happy through other people. And this person makes me happy. And my ex made me happy. And this person I really like now, I know they could make me happy if I'm with them. And, oh, you, uh, you know, oh, the relationship was bad. It's your fault. You're, you, it was just the wrong person. I was with the wrong person. You know how people say that? You know? It doesn't matter if I dated 30 people. It just wasn't. We don't have to even say they're all bad. This just wasn't the right one. 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 Okay. But if you don't know how to make it work, no one's going to be the right one. It's never going to work. It can never work. 
They can never be in a relationship. They will always do this. It doesn't matter if you are good to them or bad to them. Okay? Um, you know, basically, you're boring. All of you were boring. Any of you will be too boring someday. Right? Hormones. I mean, this is all they are. Hormones and starts going down. Now you're boring. That's where the devalue comes in. God, you suck. God, you used to be great. I don't know what happened to you. <laughs> it's like, dude, you're, it's, it's, it's a transition period in relationships that's tough in the first place for normal people. Disordered people, it, you don't make me feel good, any, feel good anymore. I'm going to go somewhere else to feel good. Easy. And, and, and that feeling good will die down no matter how good someone makes you feel. Eventually that doesn't work. You can't build a relationship on you make me feel good. We need more. Um, and they, they, those are things they, that's unexplored, unexplored territory to them. Uh, Ash from the United Kingdom. Hello, Ash. How can you tell the difference between borderline personality disorder and codependency? The symptoms seem to be the same, yet it is said that codependents date borderline and narcissists. I know people with BPD can be codependent and both can have CPTSD, but it's confusing. <laughs> because you're talking about totally different things, Ash. Okay? You know, you're talking about a personality disorder, and you're talking about codependency, which is not a personality disorder at all. Okay? And then you're talking about CPTSD and other personality disorders and then codependency. I would say codependency is a part, can be, can play a part in CPTSD. But, okay, so let's just look at borderline, codependency, CPTSD. And let's just say these are all trauma related. And let's just say that everybody has different reactions. Remember what I was saying in part one? How it really, you know, children can handle trauma. It really comes down to what kind of support system do, do they have? So, you know, what happened to me is going to be different than what happened to you, even if it's the same single thing. I'm going to react differently. You, I'm a different human being with a different brain. I have different parents, different environment, different siblings, different, you know. Um, so, this kind of you know, uh, uh, neglect, severe neglect will cause um, your emotional regulation to be poor. Can't regulate ourselves. Our parents didn't help regulate our emotions, so it's hard for us to do too. We start focusing on other people, okay, and, and stuff like this, but that, that just that will get you to start having CPTSD later in life, okay? That causes a lot of anxiety and things like this. The massive trauma causes personality disorders, causes borderline. It's just more, they, they endured more, they couldn't handle it, they didn't have support when it happened, they never healed from it. It's trauma and they're stuck in it. Um, a personality disorder is who they are and it's lifelong, okay? CPTSD is a reaction. It's simply, I'm reacting to trauma. While borderline is, it made me who I am. So the trauma is who I am, Borderlines identify with their trauma and they identify with their problems. People with CPTSD find it hard to identify and find out what the trauma was. And once they do, they have to heal from it. You know, but they can. We, we can. And it doesn't make it who you are. It doesn't determine your personality. Uh, pers borderline is, is, begins developing early on in childhood, period. And you, you, it, it's the trauma that stops their development and keeps them at five and seven years old where people just see PTSD, it didn't, it didn't completely stop their emotional development. People with CPTSD continue developing emotionally. Um, codependency, that, that, that is just such a, you know, for one thing, it gets painted with such a broad brush. Just because you're with an abuser doesn't mean you have codependency. Um, 
you know, there's a lot of different factors about codependency. Pretty much if you deal with addiction or you're with somebody with addiction or someone addiction, has addiction problems in your family, they say you're codependent. Um, there's a, an addictive element to recovering from an abusive relationship. Um, but that doesn't explain part of codependency is uh, saying that you gave someone the authority to abuse you. That doesn't tend to work with everyone that's been emotionally abused, does it? Um, so these are all medical terms, guys, to, to try to explain exactly what, what happened, what's going on. But there's a very clear separation between personality disorders and everything else, okay? Someone with CPTSD could look and act and feel like borderline for moments of their life, during the worst time of their life, okay? But they heal from it and get better. Typically, they can do that even on their own to a degree, you know? So it's not a personality disorder. It's not who they are their whole life. Um, see, the more I can just sit here and just keep going on and on and on. I hope this makes sense. Simply watch more of my videos. I have a whole playlist on borderline. I have hundreds of videos on narcissism. I have a whole playlist on CPTSD, guys. All the information is in there. Okay? Check them out. Thanks. Hope that makes sense. If not, ask me again. Is amygdala damage reversible and how? Yes, uh, I think it was the last q and I was talking about some of the damage that emotional abuse does to specific parts of your brain. And one of those parts is your amygdala. And is, and is the damage reversible? Yes, yes. This kind of uh, damage to your brain, uh, it needs to heal and it gets better. And one way is you got to stop it. You got to stop the cause. You know, if you're being burned because you're standing too close to a fire, first, first thing to do, you got to stand away from the fire. So you got to get away from the abuser. Can't be in contact. Can't look at their Facebook. Can't text them. You can't. It's causing more damage to your brain. I'm telling you. You don't have to just stand next to them. You don't have to sleep with them. They don't have to keep cheating on you. It's just contact. They screw with this. Trust me. Um, it, it's the shrinking and swelling. You know what I'm talking about. I love you. I hate you. I love you. I hate you. You're the only one. Uh, no, no, you're not. <laughs> There's other people. You know, I'll never leave you. Where are you? That causes major damage, man. But you stop it, so it stops, and it heals from sleeping. Sleep is so important. I address it all the time. If you're a client of mine, you know I address it. How are you sleeping? We need to sleep better. It's just so important, you guys. The Band-Aid daily cure to anxiety and stuff is sleep, okay? Too much of it, depression. But there's, there's things you need to deal with that, that are the cause of this stuff. But I'm telling you, sleep determines a good day, bad day. Thank you. Uh, hi, David. Alyssa from Philly. Hello, Alyssa. Have you ever heard of narcissists going through with filing for less custody with their kids? My ex-narc has esteemed career, cares a bit, a good bit about his image. He and his ex-wife still have mutual friends. Um, so yeah, you give a whole, so uh, yeah, I have heard of it and I can give you examples um, without even reading yours. This might be some of them, but um, giving up the custody because you, uh, the new person, the new supply doesn't like children. The new supply has children of their own. They think that they won't, you know, uh, uh, be, be well assimilated well. Um, uh, they want to start all over. They, you know, they, they group everything and, and compartmentalize parts of their life. And so the kids are with you and that part of their life. That was horrible. That didn't work out. That was a failure. Boom. Uh, narcissistic big time are all about success and especially career success and um, uh, image. And I don't want to have, you know, children that people know about. Literally. Um, I know narcissists in my own family like this. So they, they just don't even acknowledge they have a, a fifth child. I have four children. Here's a picture of my four children. 
start over, leave him alone. I don't know. Tons of different reasons. They hate him. <laughs> yeah. Uh, maybe, maybe something monetarily. Benefits, job, career, new, new relationships, okay? Um, all kinds of stuff. You know, I, I know they act cold, and I know they may not love you. That doesn't mean they don't feel like a failure. Failed relationships bother everybody, especially them, I'm telling you. It bothers them big time, okay? Uh, I got to hurry. Michael from Toronto, Ontario. Thanks for answering my question. You've been a huge help for my recovery. You're welcome. Thank you. I'm trying to hurry because I'm about to get cut off here. That last question. <clears throat> you mentioned that people with borderline played out their child repeatedly. I'm not sure if I'm taking this literally. Too literally. My ex has ended almost every relationship the same way. Aside from the months before of pain she put me through. Once she discarded me, she went and found some random guy, went back to his house and slept with him. She did this with the other exes also. What in the world would she be playing out? Want to hear the sick part? That night she called me at 1.50 a.m. and I saw it was her and I was worried. Long story. So I answered. I could hear her talking to a guy and I assumed it was her friend. So I hung up. The next day I texted her to tell her, letting, letting her know she had called and she replied with pocket dial. We rarely call each other. We would text 95% of the time. At this point, I did not know she slept with someone. She texted me hours later saying she was raped. So I called her. She got angry with me saying, you always make it about you or some crap. I did not believe she was a, that was a pocket dial out of anyone. She could have pocket dial. Yeah, I'm, if, you, if you know it wasn't a pocket dial, then it was a pocket dial. She wanted you to hear her talking to another guy, triangulation. Um, what would she be doing to play out her? Well, not every single thing they're doing plays out their childhood. But let's just say their borderlines are ruled by fear of abandonment, and so that's why they triangulate. Okay, I look if if I have an, an anxious security style type, I'm going to ask my 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 lover to reassure me. Often, can you reassure me? Can you reassure me? Can you reassure me? Borderlines are like anxious attachment style on crack, on, on steroids, and crack. And they're like, Ugh. and so they don't just ask. And you just telling them, reassuring them, isn't good enough. But you fighting over them, over with somebody else, okay, I feel a little secure now. Do you see that? That's how they're meeting their needs. They're controlling and getting it through other people. Sick, sick, sick. Hope that makes sense. If not, ask me again. But I got to go.